Is that a net from a cello? <laughs> That's my dream, anyhow. Uh, thank you for coming. Wow, look at this, a real people, actually. Thank you. Um, my name is Will Durst, and uh, I have a book. <laughs> um, this is unusual for me. I'm, I'm usually a stand-up comic, but uh, that I'm too old for comedy clubs now, so now I'm writing. So this is what I'm doing. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm overwhelmed to be here at the, the Powell's City of Books. I mean, this place, it's, it, there's too many books. Is there such a thing? There are too many. I mean, it, you get overwhelmed. It's like, it's like looking at an optical illusion. Um, you actually get nauseous because there's so many books. Not that I'm trying to you know, encourage that. Um, this is my second stop on my little tour. I was at Elliott Bay in Seattle yesterday, so I'm doing, you know, the top of the line right off, and then I'll go on to, like, a little Borders in a mall with three books, and nobody will show up. So I'm working my way backwards. But thank you for coming. I'm going to read a couple of things, and then uh, I'll take questions, and uh, you probably have many questions. I do. So uh, maybe I can ask you some questions. The, the book is called The All-American Sport of Bipartisan Bashing. And uh, I put a lie to that, kinda, because I say it's bipartisan, but it's all geographic. I mean, you know that here in Portland, where you're beyond blue, you're post, you're indigo, you know, I mean, you're <laughs> aubergine periwinkle, and yeah, you know the difference, you know, so that's, and the same thing with me, I live in San Francisco, and you, you know, it, it, where I'm from, originally, I'm from a small town north of Chicago, you might have heard of it, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and uh, there I'm a comic pinko yellow rat bastard, but in San Francisco, I'm a Nazi. So I, <laughs> really, there is a middle ground, and uh, I'll, I'll read a, a little section that explains my, how I came to uh, trod this, this ground, but uh, <clears throat> the first line of the first chapter kind of gives you an indication of where I actually stand. The first line of the first chapter is, George Bush is as wrong as Wyoming sushi. <laughs> and he seems determined to continue to be wrong, in a tank with no brakes headed down a hill towards a Boy Scout camp in the break of dawn sort of way. He was wrong about Saddam's weapons of mass destruction. He was wrong about Iraq's ties to Al-Qaeda. He was wrong when he told the UN that a mobile weather van was a chemical lab on wheels. He was wrong to call an invasion of a country that had nothing to do with 9-11 part of his war on terrorism. He was wrong to squander our national goodwill on a neo-comical, ideological misadventure. He was wrong about being greeted with flowers and candy, unless by flowers and candy he meant suicide bombers and improvised explosive devices. He was wrong about how long it would take, how much it would cost, how many troops would be needed, what kind of armor required. He was wrong about eating a pretzel without dunking it in beer first. Firing the Iraqi army and allowing the looting of an ancient civilization's artifacts while protecting the oil ministry, ill-advised. Mission accomplished, misguided. Bring it on, wrong-o, exponential factor 13. When Omar Bradley talked about fighting the wrong war at the wrong place at the wrong time and with the wrong enemy, he was predicting Bush. Ex <laughs> expecting a democracy to spring up from soil drenched with the blood of ancient sectarian hatreds, a critical goof. The insurgency is in its last throes, extremely erroneous. The rest of the world supporting us, inaccurate. Creating more terrorists than he's killing, iniquitous, which means wicked wrong. Counting on Iraqi Prime Minister al-Maliki to exhibit the will to succeed, delusional. They hate us for our freedoms, nope, sorry, that's counterfactual. They hate us for our guns and our bombs and the fact that we act like God hid our oil under their sand. Declaring anybody who disagrees with him is comforting the enemy, not right. He was mistaken about Iraq's falling into sectarian strife, then denying it's a civil war. And when he says we are actually winning, oh, buddy, that is so, what do you call it, imprecise. So far, the only thing he's gotten right is being born a bush and not hunting with Cheney. <laughs> mm, then it goes on. No, it's, no, no, really, there's so many places where that's going to be appropriate. <laughs> I don't want to wear you out. Uh, great co coffee in a bookstore. I love this place. <sighs> this one is uh, this one because I live in San Francisco and I live in uh, you know it's a little to the left of Fidel there. So sometimes 
I, I'm just a third generation factory rat from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So sometimes, you know, they, they can drive you nuts. I mean, you know, you, you just, sometimes you just want a cheeseburger. You don't need it covered in a mango chutney aioli. You know what I mean? <laughs> and this is an example of what happened in San Francisco. It's called spanking the diaper. I don't know if you've heard about this, but it's exactly the kind of news that compels perfectly sane people to throw their arms up in the air, bang their foreheads against brick walls, and devote the rest of their lives to eating raw cookie dough out of plastic tubs in the basement while watching Jessica Fletcher overturn police incompetence in Cabot Cove on the Biography Channel. And what the hell is Murder, She Wrote doing on the Biography Channel in the first place? But that is best left for another day. Today's harangue concerns Democratic California Assemblywoman Sally Lieber and her plan to introduce a bill to the legislature, hello bill, hello legislature, <laughs> that will make parental spanking a crime if the child is three years old or younger, labeling it misdemeanor child abuse. That's right, spank your kid, go to jail, is about to become law. Neglect to stroke a pony, pay a fine, is on the docket for next year. And the polyester banky ban, still stuck in conference. Now, don't get me wrong. I understand Lieber's motivation. As a card-carrying member of the nanny party, she's unable to control her insatiable urge to protect us from ourselves. And she's seriously against child abuse. But then again, aren't we all? And that's a good thing. But come on, do we really need a law here? Aren't most slaps to the bottom more of a Pavlovian response training exercise anyway? Throw a tantrum, get a smack, repeat till salvation occurs? Besides, unless it's full, spanking a diaper is like dropping a dime on a pillow. And when it is full, it's an exercise that neither the spanker nor the spanky is likely to forget, or more importantly, anxious to duplicate. Now, I'm curious as to exactly how the Honorable Assemblywoman proposes parents discipline their darling nippers in the event that they toss the toaster into the tropical fish tank. Perhaps a squirt gun to the back of the head, like veterinarians recommend to keep cats off the furniture. <laughs> or temporary exile to a kid terrarium upholstered an array of bubble wrap, or replacing Teletubbies with tapes of last season's The Apprentice. If Donald Trump doesn't constitute cruel and unusual, I don't know what does. Mostly, though, what worries me is misdemeanor rug rat abuse creep. I mean, how soon before the legislature is asked to outlaw stern looks, <clears throat> unseemly scents, and substandard nose nuzzling, all potentially very traumatizing to our miniature progeny. Doesn't the simple act of an adult walking past a crawling moppet constitute sheer intimidation through sizeism? Walking past a toddler? Get down on all fours, mister, and put that beer in a sippy cup. A pacifier for all my friends. Not to mention that the booming adult voice has to be a terrifying thing, so infractions of the decibel meter will be financially penalized via a complex geometric formula involving frequency and frequency. Once you cross the chair of protection threshold, the gibberish translator to protect the little angel's fragile sense of self-esteem, easily compromised by formalized language, seems to be a logical leap, and picking up a wee barn and thrusting them towards the ceiling with arms extended or riding them on one's shoulders? <laughs> Flagrant reinforcement of an overwhelming sense of powerlessness. powerlessness. All I'm saying here is it's a slippery slope, Sally Lieber, one that involves hunching way over and whispering and <clears throat> squirt guns and rampant sheep shearing and grown men sucking on nipples, and who wants that? <laughs> See, I knew that we wouldn't get it. <laughs> uh, huh, still here. <laughs> you never know. Uh, this one is called Stupid People Love Bush, New Study Proves. <laughs> I think more, more in line with what you were coming with. <laughs> According to the prestigious Southern California think tank, the Gluten Group, stupid people prefer George W. Bush over Senator John Kerry by a four to one margin. As chief resident, Dr. Lewis Friend, characterized the results of the research, the less intelligent you are, the more you like Bush. This landmark study, conducted over a five month period, involved 2,400 likely voters bridging all economic stratas in the 17 states generally considered up for grabs on November 2nd. Participants were tested for intelligence, then asked to fill out a 12-page series of questions involving the presidential candidates with results released earlier this week. 
The consensus, the higher the IQ, the less people trust Bush and respect the job he's done in the administration. The lower the IQ, the more the people admire his steadfastness. It was pretty much a slam dunk, Dr. Friend said. There's no nice way to say this. Dumb people like him. They think his unwavering nature is a positive personality trait. They venerate him for never <clears throat> admitting mistakes even when he's wrong. On the other hand, smart people think he's a lying bully. I mean, come on. You have a deserter accusing a decorated veteran of treason. Who's going to buy that besides stupid people? <clears throat> Preliminary results. IQ above 140, carry 80%, Bush 20%. 120 to 140, carry 65%, Bush 35%. 100 to 120, carry 54, Bush 46. 80 to 100, Bush 54, carry 46. 60 to 80, Bush 60%, carry 15%, Dale Earnhardt Jr. 25%. <laughs> And then it goes on. In a related study, smart people prefer baseball because the pace is such there's time to read. <laughs> uh, this one is in response to the whole, hi, thanks for coming, uh, the whole the Terry Schiavo thing. And there's not much funny about that, but uh, <laughs> uh, I attempted to prove that wrong. We'll see. It's called Plug Me In. At first, I thought the only halfway non-ghastly thing to come out of the Terry Schiavo tragedy was the delight in watching all those grandstanding politicians choke on their own bugles sounding retrieve while rear-ending each other on the way to the Tampa St. Pete airport at speeds approaching Mach 7. But I was wrong. Another positive side effect was the vast legions of citizens who awakened to the realization that we are responsible for plotting our own demise. Newspapers are print, printing primitive but binding living wills next to the Sudoku puzzle, which is good. Facing up to our mortality might force a few of us to understand there are more important things to life than parties that somebody was or wasn't invited to and whose zirconium replica of Paris Hilton dog's carler looks more real. Right now, most of the concerned introspective meditations consist of chastened yuppies adamantly professing the refusal to end up a vegetable. I guarantee that's not going to be me. I refuse to live like a rutabaggy. If you love me at all, you'll pull my plug. To these well-meaning banana heads, I have one thing to say. Not me, brother. Plug me in. I want to live. As man, as a vegetable, or as a refreshing side over a fruit salad with a light dribble of strawberry yogurt sauce. Hell, I never thought I'd make it this far to begin with. When I was a kid, anybody older than 30 was a withered ancient, a prehistoric geezer, a core sample of archaic decay. But even then, I never bought into that whole hope I die before I get old crap. And now, I'm aiming for triple digits. A couple more years, if that's all you got, it'll do. A month, part of a week, cool. Cool, all I want is extra. I want more. You see, now that I made it this far, I kind of like it. Puppies, sunsets, bases loaded, bottom of the ninths, new large print James Lee Burke mysteries, jalapeno flavored potato chips, Turner classic movies. Life is good, and I plan to hang on to it with the tips of my fingernails. If the only way to keep my respirator charged is by fluttering my eyelids 24 hours a day, I will be a flutterer. Who knows what tomorrow's scientists might come up with? Maybe they'll uncover a fountain of middle age or a perpetual eyelid flutterer. What do you think they call it the future? So you're content to linger like a vegetable? Yeah! Sure, why not? What's the big deal? Call me Mr. Potato Head like I haven't been, fo been before. You think my soul's gonna be indelibly soiled beyond repair because someone referred to me as Brussels Sprouts Boy? Soil me. Isolate a webcam on my hospice bed and pay-per-view me as the human asparagus video blog. Water me from a sprinkling can. Use my open mouth as a pencil cup and call me Shorty. Test poisonous toad cosmetics on my tongue. Lease me out as a large large prone pin cushion at a tooth tattoo arts convention. Fit me with scuba gear, bury me naked with my butt stick out of the ground, and use it as a bicycle rack. I don't care. Let me live. That's Will's living will. And if I do sink into a coma or become completely brain dead, brain dead someone try and remember to hook me up to an IV drip of pure espresso, because I don't want to miss a thing. <laughs> ah, and that's actually true. Yeah, <laughs> there's a couple of lies in here, but I can't remember what they are anymore. <laughs> but only two, I promise. Uh, this one, because you remember, uh, I mean, we 
invaded March 18th, 2003. And then for a couple of years, Bush was complaining that everything was going fine in Iraq, except the press was never showing any of the good stuff happening. So uh, I wrote this. It's called Iraqi Good Stuff. On the third anniversary of his misadventure in Iraq, President George Bush strove to sell his invasion and occupancy policy by holding a press conference and announced that getting U.S. troops out of Iraq is not his problem. Instead, it's going to be the problem of future U.S. presidents and Iraqi governments. In other words, there is no light at the end of this tunnel, just a secular gorilla holding a flashlight, and we're backing out as fast as our little cowboy boots can carry us. Civil war, the gift that keeps on giving. To say he was a bit testy is like saying freshly laid asphalt is not as, a nu as nutritious as it looks. He even snapped at Helen Thomas. For crumb's sake, who snaps at Helen Thomas? It's like biting the head off a smurf. He also proceeded to duck questions asked of him and to answer unasked questions his handlers had prepared him for and overall had the look of a guy who was trying to fake his way through not having done his homework for the last 13 semesters. He did his best to reassure America that it's not as bad as it looks over there, which is good because, to be honest, it looks pretty freaking bad over there. He was adamant that progress is being made, but when asked to explain where or how, ran into a couple of minor roadblocks, like examples of where or how we're making progress. But if he believed W, which I'm not even sure Laura and the twins do anymore, except for the prison assaults and the assassinations and the suicide bombings and the boots on the ground getting buried, things are actually pretty good. It's that darn media that's screwing everything up by showing stuff, bad stuff. If only that rascally American press could report some of the good stuff coming out of the Middle East, everyone would settle down and birds would sing and gay people would drink beer and have babies and all would be right with the world. So being the patriot that I am, I've gone out not far and done the research and collected a bunch of the good stuff coming out of Iraq and a little something I like to call, Will Durst Finds the Bright Side to Xenophobic Genocide. Baghdad University fraternity hazing's way down. Six billion dollars a month we won't be wasting on pork barrel politics. Advances in battlefield medical procedures destined to benefit all mankind. Due to the renewed dedication to killing each other, Sunnis and Shiites seem much less interested in targeting Americans these days. VFW membership roles are headed for a bull market. Grizzly footage of dead in Iraq diverting attention from that whole ugly Jack Abramoff thing. Marked increase in downtown Baghdad available parking. Every single car bomb explosion means another opportunity for Detroit fleet sales. <laughs> Senseless secular violence has obviously intensified the truce in Northern Ireland. There's a Burning Man festival every day of the week. <laughs> when you're thinking organ donor heaven, we're talking Iraq. Hey, it could be worse. There could be leeches. And the final piece of good news coming out of Iraq, where tomorrow stars of the, of the cadaver dog world get first class training today. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that was a little healthy, wasn't it? Sorry about that. Where are we? Uh, this one is called Shut Up. Shut up, please shut up. No, really, shut up, shut up, shut up. I know you think I'm kidding here, but I'm not. Pretty please, shut the hell up. Honest to God, it's not funny anymore. Would you too kindly have the simple, common human decency to close your pie holes and be quiet for half a minute? Is that too much to ask? The hell is wrong with you people anyway? The horse is dead, he's starting to smell. Put the bats down. Yes, I'm talking about the two remaining Democratic candidates who just part, part, participated in their 20th debate for it seems more like they're 8,000th. 8, and if you made it through the latest wearisome exercise in drudgery appropriately held in Cleveland, you know what I'm talking about. But if you didn't, you should immediately fall to your knees and thank your lucky stars along with every big rig accident or burnt pot roast or sorting of your sock drawer that kept you from sinking into a hole of depression deeper than a vertical zinc mine once you came to the realization that you will never, ever, ever have that 90 minutes of your life back. 90 minutes, 5,400 seconds, 3 48ths of a day, time enough to cook a four pound chicken and eat it. To listen to Green Day's American Idiot twice, read an entire Robert Parker book, round trip from San Francisco to San Jose in the fast lane of I-280, one and a half episodes of The Wire, three consecutive pizza deliveries from Domino's, 
22 and a half four minute miles, 551 hot dogs at the rate that Joey Chestnut set the world record July 4th on Coney Island. Oh my living God, it was riveting, like listening to golf on the radio in Mandarin. <laughs> Made you pine for one of those mid 50s Soviet television documentaries on hydroponic farming in the Ukraine. You know that feeling when you get when you've been driving 14 hours straight and are starting to nod off because it's 4.30 a.m. and you haven't seen a car in three hours and you figure you'll just rest one eye a little bit and open it again real quick? Well, it was a lot like that, only with tedium. Here's a news flash we don't care anymore. You've broken us. Spending 18 minutes on two health care plans that don't have a gnat's pubic hairs worth the difference between them. Not just a discussion, but an actual altercation over the distinction between the words reject and denounce. You've got to be kidding me. The two of you share similar opinions on every single policy issue of import and spend each of these interminable evenings sucking up the same special interest groups agreeing with one another. It's not a debate, it's a swimsuit competition with pants. Somebody, anybody, put an end to this misery. I am begging you before one of us snaps and rushes the stage brandishing a turkey baster full of muscle relaxers. Save us, please, Texas, Pennsylvania. If they had the tiny, s tiniest scintilla of humanity hidden in the marrow of your bones, you will stop this now. No more debates until after Labor Day. And then I'll furnish the bats and the horse. So that's, uh, these are selections. And uh, there's many more. It's uh, really thick. See, it's <laughs> got a lot of words per page. It's almost 300 pages. What is it? Oh, it's over 300 pages. And uh, that's about it. Uh, any more reading or uh, questions? Anybody? Questions? No questions. One question. How much coffee are you drinking today? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I really cut down. See, my problem is I drink black coffee, you know, but now I'm down to half-calf, and yeah, I know. Oh, well, I was, I was going to suggest you move here, but if you're on half-calf, well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. okay. But I drink black coffee. I hate going into these places, and, you get a, and you're always stuck 13th in line behind the people ordering their 12-ingredient signature drinks. You know, it's, yes, today it's Friday, so give me a double decaf, no foam, soy milk, butterfly-friendly latte with a twist of Mars lemon and a shea-grown cilantro rinse and, and make it trapezoidal. You know, it's coffee. But I was, when I was a kid, this is weird, uh, we didn't have Ritalin, so... <laughs> so I was, and they, and they fed me coffee when I was like, this was like a therapy that they did. You know, when you were like eight or nine, so they fed you coffee, so they, kink, you know, and then, uh, that was, I guess that was the idea. So I've been drinking it for a while. Sorry, I've told you way too much, once again. Anybody else? Ma'am. Why did they fire you from PBS? Oh, God. It's actually three times. I've been fired three times by PBS, twice by the San Francisco Examiner. And what happens is, you know, humor, comedy is so subjective. You know, what you think is funny is not what somebody else thinks is funny. And, and my wife is a comedian, and everybody says, oh, geez, you know, it must be. No, it's, you know, it's the same as any other relationship. We just have a similar sense of humor. And, I mean, you would never end up with a mate that he had a different sense of humor with. You know, you laugh at the same things or see stuff on the street. And, and what happens is, um, at the Examiner, twice I got hired by a guy who had a sense of humor, and then both times that guy left and a new guy came in, and uh, they didn't have the same kind of sense of humor. They didn't get this. Or I don't know if it's to be got, but, uh, you know, at least the first guy. Same thing with PBS. Uh, the people who hired me uh, enjoyed it, and then they, the next guy didn't. You know, and I'm kind of like a, a, a brown shoe, and, a, and, a, and he was an Italian loafer, you know, so it, there was definitely a, some sort of mismatching going on. And uh, yeah, five, five Emmy nominations and seven comedian at stand-up comedy of the year, and I never won anything. I'm kind of like the Susan Lucci of comedy. So. <laughs> but I don't shave my legs. Um, anybody else? Sir? Well, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your history as a, as a stand-up comic and what seemed to me, at least, having followed your career since, I don't know, 19... 
don't, don't, no. <clears throat> There's no need for that. You were my mom's favorite comic when she was little. Yeah, I've heard that one. Well, yeah, that's true. Uh, I started out 1974. I was uh, right out of high school, going into college, and um, you know, doing, doing, uh, trying to figure out. I, I was a theater major in college. I was in college with Willem Dafoe. Actually, we were in plays together at the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee, UWM. And one of our teachers, and I always wanted to be a stand-up comic. But I didn't know how to get there because you know there weren't a lot of classes, and back then there weren't any comedy clubs. So uh, he had a project. It was you know one of these pretend you're bacon you know kind of teachers. Anybody who's ever been in theater knows exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> and, and, but he was a, a great guy, so he let us do our own project, and my project was stand up. So I decided. So I spent all night, and I wrote. I was writing humor columns at the time. So I was kind of theater journalism kind of a guy. And thank God I didn't go into journalism. <laughs> Man, what a mistake that would have been. Uh, no, I'm serious. Uh, but I, I wrote an act. Uh, you know, I took all the funny parts and wrote a five, maybe 10 minute act. And then I went to class and I bought a case of long neck beers. You know, this is like two in the afternoon. Case of Lock Neck beers and stole some of those uh, aluminum, uh, you know, twisty ashtrays from uh, the student union and brought them into the classroom and closed the shades. Turned it into a comedy club and people were drinking and smoking. It was so they were they were just having fun because you know it was so odd. And then I did my little stand and then I had a routine and I actually made money on the on the gig because I sold the beers for fifty cents a piece. <laughs> First gig I ever had, I made money, but. That was 74, and every, every comic in the world at that time was doing political stuff, you know, some political stuff, because we were forged in the crucible of the Vietnam War, you know, and in high school, I mean, social studies, English, everybody referenced the war. You couldn't get away from it. Uh, it's a little different now because of five little words, D-R-A-F-T. It's that simple. That's the only difference between then and now. But uh, everybody was susceptible. So I remember my first joke, a uh, political joke. It was right after Nixon had resigned and then gone into the hospital. He went in the hospital. He resigned in August. He went in the hospital in like November. And it was kind of seen as a ploy for sympathy because, you know, he was out of office. And my joke was when the going gets tough, the tough get phlebitis. <laughs> and then I just kept doing political stuff. But I had to learn. The language of stand-up. You have to you have to figure out how to tell a joke before you can tell a joke with your viewpoint behind it. And I'm still working on that. I'm still working on that. But then I moved to San Francisco in uh, 1979, and then I went. I did a play for a year, and then I came back in '81. And San Francisco was like heaven for for comics because it was just burgeoning, you know? and uh, you could get away with a lot of political stuff there. And there was a lot of stuff happening. I mean, that was Reagan, yeah. So Reagan, man, <laughs> up until Bush. But this guy, oh, George W. He has been so good for political comedy. Honest to God, I, I am in a state of pre-mourning right now, just knowing that we're losing. I mean, no matter what you thought of him for political comedy, he, he, he was like if Reagan and Quayle had a kid. <laughs> I'm just one little cog. There's no comic left behind program. <laughs> so that's why I'm getting out of the business and becoming an author. Because, <laughs> because uh, January 21st, 2009, uh, my career is over. You know, I, I get a sell by date because Barack, it's really hard to do jokes about Barack. It is because people are so sensitive about the race thing. I have this joke in my act that I do and I'm, I talk about, oh, Barack is saying that Hillary's being mean. Oh, Hillary's being mean. Oh, yeah, because the Republicans, man, they'll try to bruise you by throwing rose petals at your head. Remember 1988, they ran Michael Dukakis, they ran Willie Horton against him. And now they're running against Willie Horton. And that's the same response. No, screw you, that's funny. But that's the same response I get across America as people go, oh, yeah. 
I'm serious. In October, the Republicans are just going to run giant ads that say Negro. And that's in the North. No, see, that's funny. That's funny. But people are, you know, it's going to take like six months before we're able to talk about race and make it funny. And it's, I don't have that kind of time. <laughs> I got a mortgage. No, no, but it was the same way in 92, because after 12 years of Reagan and Bush, you know, three continuous terms, uh, and then Clinton came in, turning my act was like turning the Titanic. It took like eight months before I could ditch all the Reagan and Bush stuff and concentrate on, on, um, on Clinton. And then, of course, in 98, Monica Lewinsky happened and everything was below the belt. And, every, and it's true, and every two-bit hack in America took his dick jokes and made him presidential dick jokes and was a political comic, you know. <laughs> Sorry, was that too, too much for a book reading? <laughs> I don't know where the limits are. This is the line, this is Durst. So that's, uh, but San Francisco, you know, like Portland, like, like Seattle, you know, because um, my stuff isn't that restrictive. It's comedy for people who read or know someone who does. <laughs> so, any other questions? Sir? Well, since the people machines have already been programmed, doesn't it seem like McCain is going to win and therefore you will have an extension on your career? You know, I don't know if they can program past a landslide. And right now, the Republican brand is in the dumper. I mean, you saw in Mississippi, in Mississippi, what was it on Tuesday? A Democrat won a special election against a Republican that, had, and a Republican had held that seat for 34 years, and the guy was, uh, he, the guy who was in that seat uh, because Trent Lott retired, so he can't. He filled Trent Lott's seat, so they had to have. And they ran Barack and Nancy Pelosi against this guy. And uh, this guy, the Democrat, who won, his name is Childers, I think. And uh, he's 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 not really a Democrat, but in Mississippi he is. But it, no, because he's pro-gun and anti-abortion. He's kind of like you've heard of Reagan Democrats. Well, this guy's like a Cheney Democrat. Okay, so so he's not really a Democrat, but. It still matters. I mean, the Republican brand, but I just think that Republicans will do whatever it takes. You know, and I really believe that. And, and they really believe that, too. It, they're not bad people. They don't, they, nobody, nobody thinks they're the bad guy. Nobody wakes up in the morning and goes, oh, geez, I wonder how deep of a reeking heap of steaming feces I could lay today. You know, I mean, every, everybody thinks that they're doing you know, and they just have different priorities and focuses, and, 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 and they're, conservatives are always willing to compromise. You know, liberals are never willing to compromise because you can't compromise the truth. And uh, Ralph Nader, and I know you love your Ralph Nader, but I do not love your Ralph Nader. <laughs> I still, yes, I hold him responsible, and don't give me that, America can't get better till it gets worse. Ralph, ding, 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 it's worse. I don't want worse -er. This is as worse as I want. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so and I understand, but uh, Clinton said, and, and Clinton rephrased this, it was a famous saying, the enemy of the good is the perfect. And that always, you know, liberals always get caught up in minutia. Always minutia. You know, I mean, uh, you try to build a, a, a ramp for the handicap. Oh, now you don't call them handicap. Well, all right, try to, for the physically challenged. They're not physically, what are they? They're, they're, uh, they're, Differently abled. You know, a handicap don't care what you call them. Crip, gimp, or stumpy, just build them a ramp. You know? And conservatives can always reach uh, some sort of uh, uh, commonality. Well, I think your facts are specious. Your arguments are lying, and your entire philosophy is repugnant. There's more money in it for it. Congratulations, you have swayed me with your reasoned argument. <laughs> Is that a little long <laughs> answer? But yeah, I, they can't. And I understand you're, you're with the D-bolt machines, and I'm not happy either. And, but you got to admit, Florida was just <laughs> old Jews voted for a Nazi. I mean, come on, that's, they were confused, <laughs> OK? Even Pat Buchanan said, these are not my people. <laughs> uh, ain't life odd? 
Anybody else? Sorry. <laughs> Too much for a little thing like this, isn't it? <laughs> Shh, quiet. It's a bookstore. <laughs> it's, like, it's like a golf clap. <laughs> <laughs> Sir. Yeah, do you find there's a, a lot of uh, comic uh, potential with Arnold uh, Schwarzenegger? Or, or have you sort of got away from you know, here it says uh, raging moderate, and I know that's an oxymoron. You know, it's like uh, military intelligence or uh, Democratic Leadership Council or uh, Republican Ethics Committee. I understand that, but there is something to be said about the middle, because you think 20% of America is deep, deep liberal, 20% is deep, deep, and there's 60% in the middle. And they're never, you never hear of them. You never hear the people, and they, they outnumber the fringes three to two, and yet you watch CNN or, or, you know, or Fox News, and it's always from the left, from the right, well, Fox, from the right, from the writer, okay, but still, I mean, you never hear the people in the middle. And I kind of like Arnie, and I didn't expect that I would. I like him because he has managed to tick off both Republicans and Democrats, and he can't run for governor. I mean president, he can't run for president, and that, that makes me like him even more. <laughs> I'm serious because he doesn't, he's not looking beyond. Gray Davis, who was our former governor, did not pardon one person in California because he was so afraid of having a Willie Horton come back and bite him in the butt on his aspirations to the president. Not one person, didn't matter how convincing, how many parole boards, how many people said, oh, this guy might be innocent, didn't matter, he wouldn't, he wouldn't not pardon one, and that just, you know, just because of his political ambitions. And Arnie doesn't care. Arnie's, you know, you come up with the evidence. And, although I wish he'd, <laughs> he just keeps using lines from his movies, you know, and it's so, I swear to, to govern, you know. Hasta la vista, voters' rights. Uh, he, how many times has he said, I'll be back? You know, that, that was cute the first 8,000 times. During the, during the special election, he actually said, you can't handle the truth. Arnie, that's not even your movie, man. That's, that's Jack Nicholson, you know. That's, what's next? I don't know nothing about birth and no babies. You had me at hello. Yeah, so I, uh, but now, and now, ha, 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 he is, uh, he is caught in the same trap that Gray Davis was, uh, that Gray Davis, the guy that he, because he wasn't the guy, uh, Arnie didn't call for the recall, Arnie just jumped in with uh, this other guy, Daryl Issa, who was a car alarm magnet, he's the guy who financed the recall, then he expected that the Republicans would annoy him, and Arnie just, pow, you know, and, but Gray Davis got in the same kind of trouble that Arnie's getting in now, because of the dot-com boom, and then the bust, and then the lower, lower, uh, you know, revenues coming into the state, and of course politicians, you know, they always base their next budget on, you know, not just the money that you have coming in last year, but also projected growth. You know, nobody, <laughs> nobody ever thinks of what goes up may come down. So Arnie's getting caught in the same thing, lowered revenues. But he's so smart because he kept saying, oh, there's a 20 billion, 200 billion, uh, two, it's huge. And, the, <laughs> and then it turned out to be less than what he said it was. And he said, look it, I've already fixed it. You know, <laughs> so he's, <laughs> he's, not, he's smart. <laughs> yes, yes. I don't know what the marriage of Maria Shriver is about though. I think it's phase one in a genetic experiment to breed a bulletproof Kennedy. I do. Tough crowd, tough crowd. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Anybody? No? I don't blame you. <laughs> Come on, one more question, then I'll, and then we'll sign books or something. Nothing? Nobody? All right. Uh, Jeremy? They're done with me. Oh, yes, ma'am. No, I don't think Hillary Clinton should drop out. Uh, for one thing, something could happen, you know, like cataclysmic, like uh, uh, Puerto Rico becomes a state, you know, I mean, <laughs> something could happen. But also, I mean, she's going to knock his block off in Kentucky. He's going to win here, but she's going she's gonna to win in Kentucky. And how does it look for a candidate, you know, who's... Uh, being carried on a litter through the teeming throngs to his coronation to lose 
to somebody who's not running anymore, you know? So at least run out the string till June 3rd, and then she can... But uh, there, no, it's not going to be no dream ticket. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. <laughs> if you think America, if you think for even a minute that America is going to vote for a woman and a black man at the same time, then that, that's where your dreaming comes in, right there. That's, yeah, you're living in Ambien City. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, the only reason he might pick her is for assassination insurance. Yeah. But even then, he'd have to hire a food tester. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Settle down, people. Yes, ma'am. Actually, you brought that up. It's kind of a talking to friends, and even my husband has a coworker who is a black woman that doesn't think, she honestly is very candid, but she doesn't think Barack Obama, he might get elected, but he won't make it to the president. Jeremy was watching uh, the, the young gentleman who introduced me with that sterling introduction where he said that he was honored to have me here. Um, he just said that tonight he was watching the news and Michael Huckabee was at the NRA and something crashed off stage. And uh, he said, oh, that's uh, somebody just assassinated Barack Obama. That's his body hitting the floor. Well, there goes his VP nomination. <laughs> Chuck Norris has a better shot now than uh, Mike Huckabee does. I'm getting McCain's. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't know what that stems from. I, I know he's, he's from Arkansas. <laughs> we could all make that leap. But that's, you know, that's so geographic kissed. <laughs> what, is, what would that be? Geographic kissed? Where you make fun of people because of where they're from? I think Reginalist. Reginalist. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I'm using that. That's so Reginalist. Well, I'm from Wisconsin. You know, everybody's got a dork town. I mean, what do you guys got? Renton? All right. Oh, that's Washington? What's yours? Boring. Boring? Well, boring. I mean, come on. That does double duty there. But there's another one. Milwaukee, maybe? Gresham, Gresham, yeah. See, that's your dork town. Everybody's got, even Gresham has a dork town, you know? They just make fun of. That would be boring. <laughs> you know, this isn't good when the audience is funnier than the comic. <laughs> and this is going out on the web, so you guys are in deep doo doo. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I, I think this is scary the fact that people are able to make jokes about it. Yeah. And uh, I lived through that time, you know, 63, 68, 68. And then there were other guys like uh, Malcolm X and, and Lenny Bruce. And, uh, you know, no, no, that was drugs, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, in that five-year period, so many people died. We just got so used to it. And then, and then uh, it hasn't happened for a while, so... Yeah, not that I'm a conspiracist. <laughs> I may be a regionalist, but I'm not a specific <laughs> conspiracist. Anyway, sir. Uh, who are your comics? Who, who did you learn from? And oh, I'm a, I'm a who sucker. Did you, who did you learn today? Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm Pollyanna. Anybody who has the cojones to get up on stage and attempt to make people laugh out loud on purpose against their will, I think is uh, you know, that's admirable. It's hard to do. And, uh, of course, I started out with, you know, the Grand Masters, Lenny Bruce and Mort Saul and Dick Gregory and Richard Pryor and uh, Steve Martin and Carlin. <clears throat> and, and today, you know, there are just so many good people. And the kids, I don't even know the kids. And they're incredibly good kids coming up. So, uh, But Louis Black is very funny, good friend. A uh, bunch of other people. Sorry. Too many didn't mention. You again. I guess, sorry about that. Is there a distinction between writing comedy as opposed to these tensions that really Two different voices. I mean, sometimes I will come up with a line and build a, build a, a column around it. Sometimes I'll write a line in the column and you be able to use it on stage. But uh, so many things that I do. I wrote, I wrote something in here that became a stage performance piece, and I call it my drum solo, and uh, it's, 
I am so sick and tired of these lying, thieving, holier-than-thou, right-wing, cruel, crude, rude, coarse, crass, cocky, corrupt, criminal, crooked, dishonest, dissolute, degenerate, debauched, delusional, jingoistic, homophobic, xenophobic, xylophonic, racist, sexist, ageist, fascist, cassist, arrogant, ignorant, inept, inbred, insipid, illicit, insolent, impotent, incompetent, incontinent, Insufferable, pompous, gutless, spineless, shameless, noxious, poisonous, avaricious, malicious, merciless, graceless, tactless, brutal, brutish, spiteful, vengeful, persistent vegetative state grandstanding, nuclear, nuclear option threatening, <laughs> irony deprived, depraved, erectile, dysfunctional, Preemptory invading of a country that had absolutely nothing to do with 9-11, 35-day vacation taking, greedy exponential factor 15, domestic spying, CIA outing, constitution shredding, bicycle falling, brush clearing, monkey face, pretzel choking, hunchback smirk and draft dodge and trust funding, Muslim baiting, hurricane disregarding, oil company filleting, your hand under a rock, the maggoty remains of a marsupial, just won't get off the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge drilling, Two-faced, lawyer shooting, voting machine tampering, sociopathic, psychopathic, consensuspathic, partisanpathic, pathic, pathic, air and ground and water and media pollutant, which is pretty much all the pollutant you can get, vile, venal, vulgar, venomous, villainous, vomitous, vituperative, virulent, mephitic, bloodthirsty, yellow belly, edipal, edipal, not edible, evil, I'm not sure if I said evil, I want to make damn sure I say evil. <laughs> Cretinous, fool, toad, butt wipe, lizard stick, corporate, imperialistic, lackey, slime, bucket tools of this administration that I could just spit. <laughs> oh, there you are. Okay. Now I found your core. So when I so when I wrote it, it was longer. And then I had to turn it into a performance piece, and it took months of molding months of and I had to and just memorizing it you know so I had to memorize it in chunks and then make sure that all the bridges linked together and in case they didn't I could move on to it you know insert it somewhere else but uh, that, that was an interesting exercise in, in how writing is different than performance and uh, that's the drum solo and I use it on stage when I find a, a crowd of your political event um, <laughs> But I can't do that when I do my corporate gigs. <laughs> you can imagine. Yeah. All right, too much honesty here. Um, <laughs> a million little pieces. <clears throat> uh, th uh, thank you so much for braving the uh, equatorial heat and uh, coming on down. And you're wearing a sweater. My God, lady, what's wrong? Um, <laughs> Thank you. Oh, and that everybody looks. Yeah. Was, uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank uh, the 503, and uh, um, I hope you buy a book. Thank you. You've been listening to comic columnist and author Will Durst reading from his new book, The All American Sport of Bipartisan Bashing Common Sense Rantings from a Raging Moderate. Will Durst is a regular commentator for Audible.com, Air America. CNN, and National Public Radio. He's also a syndicated columnist and continues to perform at clubs, theaters, and benefits. To find out more about Will Durst and his work, please visit his website at www.willdurst.com. This program was produced by PDX Justice Media Productions. To find out more about our work, please visit our website at www pdxjustice.org. You'll find programs featuring speakers such as Naomi Klein, Paul Krugman, Susan Faludi, Kevin Phillips, Amira Haas, Rashid Khalidi, and many others. Thanks for tuning in, and thanks for supporting listener-sponsored radio, public access cable television, net neutrality, and all forms of grassroots, democratic, community media.